life. Probably the most fascinating thing that exists for philosophers, poets, and of course, scientists. Humans have always wondered if we were alone in this vast universe. Like a puppy dog in a giant mansion, we would probably feel better if we had some companionship. So we started to explore by our own means, mostly by our imagination, until the invention of the telescope in the 17th century. But what information can telescopes provide us with in the search for older extraterrestrial life? And where should we look for it? Before answering these questions, let's take a look at the sun and our spaceship, the Earth. The sun the sun is a mediocre star, it is neither small nor big, it is medium sized, a so called big dwarf that is neither the hottest nor the coolest. As for the Earth, we are neither too close nor too far from the Sun, the planetary equivalent of the midpoint between Ashton Kutcher and Charlie Sheen. We are where we should be for life to prosper, existing in the habitable zone of the Sun, like the Moon and Mars. Now you may have detected a pattern here. In universal terms, we're not at the extreme of anything. Philosophers call it the mediocrity principle. It means that we are probably not as special as we thought we were or are, especially about six centuries ago. Back then it was believed that the Earth was in the center of the universe. It was a scientific equivalent of a teenager who thinks the world revolves around them. Luckily though, we've matured a bit since then. The Sun is only about 4.6 billion years old, while the universe is about 13.8 billion years old, roughly of course. During the time before the Sun's birth, billions of stars formed and died. So why don't we see any form of life in the older, more distant stellar systems? The answer comes in two parts. First, we must consider the possibility of the existence of extraterrestrial life before the Sun was born. So could life have appeared around the first stars ever born in the early ages of the universe? It seems unlikely. We know that most stars in the universe are dwarfs. Their relatively small mass, and hence size, makes their habitable zone closer to them. Given this proximity, rocky planets would lose their atmosphere, which would be stripped away by the stellar winds. Besides, the ultraviolet radiation would kill every form of life on the planet's surface. Second, we know that hydrogen was predominant in the universe. It is what was needed to ignite the first stars. But life as we know it requires the existence of heavy elements that form by stellar nucleosynthesis, like stars burning or supernovas. It is the nuclear fusion of lighter elements to form heavier elements such as oxygen and carbon and iron. Then they're spreading into space through explosions. So just like being short of one thing when no rocky planets could form in the first place due to the absence of materials, this means that we had to wait a little bit until some like stars were born. Keep in mind that our sun is not the first of its kind to exist in the universe. In fact, many solar type stars like with similar heavy element abundance must have formed. And this is proven by the observable existence of white dwarves, which are the last stage in the life cycle of a solar type star. Solar type means sunlight, our sun. So it's possible that intelligent life could have appeared somewhere around these types of stars before life appeared on Earth. But how can we know for sure? Starting with our solar system, we can begin by looking for some debris in space or on planets such as Mars or the Moon, perhaps left behind by ancient civilizations. And this is the purpose of the recently announced Galileo project at Harvard University by Avi Loeb. Yet we should also explore further. Just as our main messenger from the cosmos is light that is emitted or reflected by celestial objects, our main source of information about intelligent extraterrestrial life will be the light they emit in the spectra of their planet or star. Hence, we should be looking for biosignatures, such as the presence of methane and oxygen in the planet's atmosphere. Astronomers use a process called spectroscopy to identify these elements. We should also target technosignatures too though, which are mainly electromagnetic signals such as radio signals, laser transmissions, and perhaps even city lights, or signs of pollution from industrial production in exoplanets' atmosphere. Unfortunately though, with the technology we have now, this would only work for stars located in our galaxy. And if we want to detect early technological civilizations outside the Milky Way, we would require them to have made some sort of tremendous technological advances that would have allowed them to beam extremely intense beacons of light or transform their surroundings. To achieve this, they would have had to have the ability to use the energy of neighboring stars. So we're talking about the big leagues, I guess you could say, of technological innovation here, but probably beyond that. Probably beyond something we could even imagine. Remember, 
Today, we are able to exploit only a small percentage of the solar energy we get from our sun. We cannot send intense signals that survive the intergalactic medium yet. So for us to locate them, they had to have been more technologically advanced than us, with this technique at least. As we said earlier, life as we know it also requires a certain range of temperature, which requires the planet to be in the habitable zone of its star. This allows water to exist in a liquid form. But could there be any form of life that is fundamentally different from ours? We have seen that life exists on Earth in the most extreme conditions of temperature, pressure, etc. Therefore, we cannot rule out the possibility that intelligent life exists in other forms that we expect. And this raises many further questions. If we ever find intelligent life in space, how will we react? Will we welcome them with respect in our minds and love in our hearts? Or will we be fearful and hostile, thinking only about domination and a potential opportunity to exploit? Or perhaps, maybe they'll be thinking the same thing. But as far as humans go, history suggests the latter. And the sponsor of this video, Magic Spoon Cereal. Magic Spoon Cereal is a cereal which is quite delicious, but also magically extremely healthy instead of just being magically delicious. I am surprised this stuff wasn't made a long time ago. It almost feels like certain larger corporations wanted to get you addicted to all the sugar they were serving you for breakfast using boxes of Olympic athletes on them saying that they contain some vitamin C. But nowadays, unless you're a child, you're an adult. And maybe you want to get back that nostalgic feeling of eating cereal every morning for breakfast but without spiking your insulin because the cereal was made from pure sugar when you were a kid, thus causing you to have an insulin spike in the morning, becoming quickly tired afterwards, and probably the reason for you having difficulty paying attention in fourth grade. But look at this stuff. It has 14 grams of protein per serving. This is almost more of a protein supplement than it is a cereal. Four grams of net carbs and zero sugar. A high protein breakfast is proven to not affect insulin levels as opposed to a high carbohydrate one. You're basically eating a mixture of pure whey and casein protein as it's literally the number one ingredient on the ingredients list. To sweeten the cereal, the creators used a blend of alulose, a sugar naturally found in figs or raisins, and monk fruit extract. Both are natural alternative sweeteners, with calories that, interestingly, the body does not seem to absorb due to the biochemistry of them. And that's followed up with some pretty high quality oils containing unsaturated fats like avocado oil, which just has a tremendous amount of research in terms of its benefits, and then high oleic sunflower oil shown to reduce total and LDL cholesterol by 10%. A high protein breakfast increases satiety throughout the day, lowers the craving to eat food as a coping mechanism for stress, and positively affects other hormonal and neural signals. But how does this super healthy magic cereal taste? Well, luckily, I have a bunch of boxes. So let's taste them. First, we have peanut butter. I like my cereal dry. I don't know how they did this, but it does taste like a Reese's peanut butter cup. It's got fruity. It tastes kind of fruity, um, like another cereal that you may know about that has the word fruity in it. Frosted. This is a bit sweeter. Not as like powerful of a, as a flavor of the peanut butter one, but I still I still like it. So if you want to regain that kid-like nostalgia of eating cereal during breakfast without giving yourself diabetes as an result, but instead packing yourself with protein or just want a quick snack sometime that's quick and healthy, I honestly, I'm surprised it's the only cereal or I'm, I'm just surprised no one's thought of this before. Anyways, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com slash strange mysteries to get $5 off your first variety pack. Do it now.